everybody. Ooh. Nice to be here. Um, and uh, as I think most, uh, most of the sessions have gone, it's really exciting to be back in person. Um, it's my distinct pleasure, told, again, to come guys. back this year uh, in person uh, and serve as your chair of the final word panel. Uh, and great to be back here at the, at the Fairmont Royal York as well. My name is Stephen O'Brien. I'm the city clerk at the city of Guelph. Uh, and prior to my time at Guelph, I was with the city of Richmond Hill and York Region and also spent time uh, at the early part of my career, actually started my career at a lower tier in Bruce County, northern Bruce Peninsula. Um, welcome again to all my panel colleagues. Uh, we've got a couple of new faces, so I'll get through to introducing them in, the, in, in just a moment. What I'd like to do first to start off is um, just give you a bit of context about what the panel is, what the goal of our, our, uh, our esteemed colleagues here are and, and uh, what the panel is intended to do for you as delegates. We're really intended to be here as practical and pragmatic support for delegates. We look forward to answering both questions from the box that we received, uh, as well as questions from the floor. And I'm going to say that again. We really, really welcome questions from the floor. So don't be shy. I will do my best to sort of peek around at the different mics, but please do come forward. Uh, any question is a good question, uh, and we encourage you to come forward and ask those questions. I'm going to introduce the panel now. To my immediate left here is uh, Gary Kent. Gary is the Chief Financial Officer and Commissioner of Corporate Services with the Region of Peel. Prior to Peel, Gary spent 25 years with the City of Mississauga, most recently as CFO and Commissioner of Corporate Services as well. He's a professionally accredited as a CPA and CGA, and he currently sits as a director with the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, and he sits on their board of directors. Middle of the group here is Rob Walton. Rob's a face that I think may be familiar to a lot of folks. He's been on the panel for some time. He's the general manager of operations for Brant County. He's a professional engineer with 37 years experience in work for municipalities. He's a member of the Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Council from 2004 to 2016. And he's also a trainer at the Walkerton Clean Water Center standard of care under Ontario's clean water legislation. At the end is our respectfully Sid, the wily veteran of the panel, uh, Sid Vanderveen. Sid's been on the panel since 1992. Uh, he's a civil engineer who retired three years ago as drainage coordinator for uh, at OMAFRA. Um, and when he was there, his responsibilities included administration of the Drainage Act, the Tile Drainage Act, the Agriculture Tile Drainage Installation Act. Sid now works at RJ Burnside uh, and Associates as a drainage engineer, and he continues to provide training uh, four municipalities through the Ridgetown College campus at the, of the University of Guelph. Go Griffins, I can say that, I'm a proud Griffin alum. Uh, Terry Kuypers, to the left of Gary here. Terry has been a building official for the past 22 years. He's an instructor of the Ontario Building Code courses with the OBOA and is a director on their board of directors. Terry's currently with the town of Minto, uh, serving as the director of building planning services and his municipal career started at the city of Mississauga prior to Minto. He's also helped many municipalities in, in uh, Wellington County, Center Wellington, Wellington North, uh, to name a few. And last but certainly not least, second from the end is Kristen Newman. Kristen has been with the municipality of Lakeshore for just under four years as the corporate leader of strategic and legal affairs. Prior to joining Lakeshore, Kristen was with the city of Greater Sudbury and she completed her articles with the city of London. Kristen has attended, or sorry, attended law school at the University of Windsor, uh, studied political science at Queen's, and worked in economic development and compensation prior to starting her career as a municipal lawyer. So, quick, some quick rules. Um, written questions will be presented by the panel uh, first, then we'll go to questions from the floor, so I'll look out. Thank you for the lighting, that's a big help. Uh, we'll look out to see if anyone uh, wanders up to the mic, and again, please do. Uh, when you come to the mic, if you can please identify yourself, your office, the municipality that you're from, we ask that you have one question only, uh, no multi-part questions. That's to encourage multiple individuals to come forward and ask questions. Uh, and ideally, the question should be not necessarily of a local interest to your local municipality, but perhaps something that's also uh, applicable to the broader sector as well. So if you can consider that when you're coming forward. And my, my personal favorite in terms of rules is uh, the moderator gets the final right to uh, make any other rules as I see fit going forward. So <laughs> I'll put that one out there. So let's jump in. Let's get, uh, let's get some questions done uh, in terms of uh, some questions we received from the question box uh, at the beginning of the conference, and we did receive a few. So I'll start. And I think this one, Sid, maybe for you, maybe Rob, you want to wander in a little bit on this one as well, but it's a long one, and it's, it's a really good one, complex. We are predominantly a rural municipality that is in the process of a new subdivision development. The stormwater management for the development has been designed by engineers, reviewed by engineers, reviewed and approved by the MECP and the local conservation authority. 
Yet I still have a nagging concern about the discharge from the stormwater management system. Given all the professional design and approvals, is there a, any chance that our municipality, once we assume the subdivision, could be held liable for impacts downstream of the stormwater discharge point? Sid, you want to jump in? Rob, you can jump in. So, Rob, you are going to join in on this one later Absolutely. on? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, probably disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rob just said that uh, probably disagree. So, um, so I think it's a fair comment to be, uh, be con sorry, first of all, good morning, everyone. I, I should do that first. Um, next, though, is um, you should be having nagging concerns. Um, my experience is that storm, discharge from stormwater management, um, they'll control peak flows for the most part and not necessarily the volumes. And the volumes of water coming out of these stormwater management systems could have an impact on downstream property owners. I've used the example before of a, uh, of a, a stormwater management system. This is actually a real case scenario where outletted into a farmer's tile and, um, and the tile um, has a certain capacity, and now that capacity is being used up by the stormwater discharge, and, uh, and he's going, I paid for this, now you're using it, um, something's wrong here. So it needs to be looked at from a broader perspective than just um, peak flow controls, and, um, and uh, there needs to be an examination of what's happening downstream and is there a, a proper outlet for this stormwater management system. Um, so look beyond just the ponds. Um, anything to add, Rob? Well, I think you need to you know, determine whether you've got a legal outlet. You know, are you outletting into yeah. a natural water course and, and, uh, and is that a legal outlet? And I think in the days of climate change, we all have to think about what the changes are gonna be to here. Um, if your engineers that are working on this are, are thinking about things like that, your, your chances of having problems are less. So they're, they're you know, divine, not designing it to the minimums, designing it to a bit more. You actually can make the situation, there's possibilities of making the situation better if you hold back things in a way that makes it less uh, prone to erosion or whatever downstream. You, you may actually make the situation better. But you have to think of what's going to happen in the future too and you have to look at what that legal outlet would be and that there's the secret right there. yeah legal outlet um the um you can have all the permits and approvals in place and still be held liable under the common law if you aren't discharging it to a proper legal outlet great thanks guys um there's, uh, there's always questions that come in around liability and, and legal liability uh, that municipalities face i think uh Unfortunately, we live in a pretty litigious world. <laughs> um, so Kristen, this might be one for you. It's a general question. Um, and it's around what are we seeing in terms of trends in, in terms of municipal liability? What, what things are coming across your desk? What are you hearing from your colleagues and other municipalities? Uh, and what's bubbling up in that regard? Uh, this, is a, this is a bit of a departure, I would say, from, from straight up questions regarding drainage and roads. And, and again, I should say, hello, nice to see everybody <laughs> again. Uh, nice to see people in person, which is the thing I'm saying most these days. Uh, it's lovely to be back uh, here. And uh, I also have to, of course, in good legal fashion, put on the disclaimer that these are not, this is not legal advice and uh, please seek out specific legal advice to any concerns you have and uh, of course this is an information that reflects the views of my employer. Um, <laughs> with all of that said, so any of you that sit at, at the municipal council table uh, that have dealt with insurance policies, uh, one of the number one uh, issues and I think it's, there's a financial piece to all of this uh, is that we're seeing a lot of trending toward cyber issues. So this takes us far away from the question of roads and operations, but it's a big issue. Um, a number of you, your municipalities may have faced uh, municipal insurability issues. I'm consistently hearing that municipalities are not able to seek cyber insurance, that they're uh, continuously threatened by uh, mostly, a, a big one is ransomware, but uh, all sorts of kind of social engineering type uh, fishing expeditions and all sorts of cyber, cyber exercises that are exposing municipalities. Of course, municipalities, uh, 
different than the private sector, a uh, lot of competing resources for a lot of competing things, and it's a, you know, it's a great tie-in. If you have a roads, roads, roads budget, it's really hard to be putting those uh, resources towards your cyber infrastructure, which, if it works really well, you never see the benefit of, but let me tell you, when it doesn't work, there are big concerns, and that's impacting your insur insurability. Uh, so more and more, uh, that's, you see it splashed across the newspaper, but we're seeing it, I think, at, at the budget level, at the budget table, uh, when municipalities are renewing insurance policies. Uh, so, so that one continues to be, and it's, it's consistent with the trend toward big concerns around privacy, protection of personal information. Municipalities hold a lot of information. And so there's, there's a great desire to get, if you're, if you're a, a bad actor, get a hold of that and make use of it and hold a municipality hostage. And I would say that's one of the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, uh, and, and you know, there may be other panelists that we can comment on that, how they're seeing it at the financial end. Well, I think the other thing too is, is you know, mitigating against that, you know, having those policies in place is, is sort of the ultimate sort of backstop. But you talk about, you know, finite resources, right? We've all got an infinite amount of areas in which municipalities spend and allocate funds and important things that are, you know, demanded of you as, as, uh, as elected officials or, or municipal staff. One of the things that we probably ought to be spending a lot of time is in training around those things, right? How to, how to, how to spot those social engineering type attacks that come across people's emails. And uh, I recall a story a few years ago uh, out of the city of Ottawa that, that I think the treasurer of the time was, was you know, caught in a bit of a vicious cycle of that. So, you know, again, it's, it's finite resources. It's another thing to train staff on, but it's, it's valuable and it's important because municipalities are seen as, you know, whether small or large, deep pockets, right? So they're an easy, an easy target for some of these sort of bad actors out there in the cyber world. So certainly the insurance, but also if you can think about training and if you can, you know, pool resources amongst municipalities, that's a really great way, I think, to think about training and such. Um, I wanted to ask a question, or one of the questions that came up was really good, and I think it's been a theme throughout the conference, and there's been some sessions and, and uh, discussion points on this, but around supply chain issues. So, um, Gary, probably best for you, but I know, Rob, as sort of a municipal engineer, you're, you're probably seeing this in projects as well. We're seeing supply chain issues and inflationary pressures, especially in construction. Um, what are you seeing in 2022 tenders that are coming in? How do you see this rolling out for future municipal budgets? And what are you thinking about as either, you know, a chief financial officer, treasurer, or uh, a, a municipal engineer? So, Gary, maybe we'll start with sure. you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, whatever the time is. Uh, I think, you know, how do we deal with well, what we've seen? We've, we've seen everything you've said. So you may know asphalt's gone up about 47%, oil's gone up about 63%, natural gas is over 100%. The, the, you know, the, the whole uh, global issue of the war uh, in Ukraine, you know, uh, I was coming in in the, the, the go train today and I was listening to my neighbours who were talking loud and they were talking about how they couldn't get IT equipment because of the chips uh, that are unavailable. It's really a disrupted world. So in terms of the finances, uh, I think patience is required. Uh, we're, we're seeing delays in construction. We're, we're cancelling some uh, housing projects, which is very unfortunate given the system because the, the bids just didn't come in. Uh, we're, we're starting to use a lot more direct negotiation uh, to, to get around some of that, but that puts the price up uh, as well. Uh, in terms of some of the other financial risks, I mean, uh, I think cyber has been spoken about. Uh, there's a lot of bad actors out there, and you know the good guys are good, but the bad guys are, are better in that front. But supply chain and inflation go hand in hand, and I think when you're doing your budgets for next year, you're used to a very stable environment, uh, and inflation, of course, is impacting your citizens, the house prices, but also all the construction projects that, that are out there. Uh, I mean, there's more pressures on, on finances, if you want me to elaborate on that. Uh, but you know, supply chain is just one. How we'll handle the supply chain piece uh, is really, we're fortunate that we've got some reserves. We think we can weather the storm. Uh, we're assessing whether we should slow down our capital program just now. <coughs> Growth is still a big issue in Peel, so that becomes very political and very local as well. So we're, we're, we're trying to make informed uh, decisions, being transparent with the public mm. around all of that in council. And I think for councils, it's going to take a bit of re 
uh, readjustment because they're used to that stable inflation. They're used to just saying, no, just get it done. But there's factors outside your control uh, that will prevent that, that, yeah. that from coming. So I'll leave it at that. And yeah, Rob, do you finance. want to add anything else? So some sort of boots on the ground Thanks. you're seeing in terms of projects? Thanks, Stephen. I'll add a few things to that. I think that the things that we're seeing um, are contract availability and labor. Treats. Things like line painting supplies, steel rebar, vehicles, all of those things are, are in supply chain issues. And um, when you're talking about contractor availability and the labor, um, I think that councils have to be realistic and, and staff has to be realistic on what your work plan is for the year. Like we've had you know, a lot of money being spent on, on infrastructure or whatever, but can you do those projects? You have to think of whether you can do them. And I like the point that Gary made about direct negotiations. There are, there are a place now for different ways of procuring than straight out tenders. And RFPs sometimes, direct negotiations, um, contract management maybe on some projects instead of um, um, bidding in and getting, because contractors can't fix in all of their prices, so they're gonna be risk, taking risk on some of those. They never take risk on those things. We take the risk on those things. Mm. So think about what you're doing and, and build that into it. Yeah, great, thank you folks. There's a question here, which is great. First question from the floor. Thank you, sir, go ahead. Yeah, Fred, is this on? Yep, you're okay. on. Okay, uh, Red Ross from City of Guelph. Um, so actually, this was the question I was gonna ask. Um, and I, but I wanted to put a little different spin on it. Uh, every municipality in this room is dealing with uh, COVID cost inflation. The, and we can't do anything individually about the underlying cost of fuel or the cost of pipe or anything. But what we can deal with is contractor risk premiums that get attached to our contracts. So, Rob, what are the tips and tricks that uh, we can pass on to those in our room here to help help reduce that contractor risk premium? Okay, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, and, and feel free, the rest of the panel, jump in. So I already started to answer this <laughs> in the last answer, but I, I think that there are a few things to, to understand. One is what you, the components of your particular project you're looking at and what the, the pinch points would be in that. So what are the things with their supply chain issues? And we've had a couple where we said, okay, they can't get, we did a, we just did a tender and it's got a maybe 150,000, 200,000 uh, component of electrical in a $4 million job. Carry contingency in that and don't even have them price it right now. Live with them having your construction managed after is, is a way to consider on something like that. Um, understanding other things. So, and, uh, and understanding what the risks are. You know, this year, don't put out a tender in the 1st of September for something to be done by the end of the year. It's unrealistic that it would ever happen. Like, if you have a big project and you're not out for tender now, you're, you're soon going to be in trouble. You're not just not even going to get contractors. So I think understanding what the pinch points of the, of the project are and then working around those certainly helps. Yeah. I didn't ask Reg to plant that question as a fellow City of Guelph employee. In fact, I feel like a complete fool because he stood up and took his mask off and I went, there's Reg. <laughs> Sorry, does anyone else want to add any comments? Gary, did you want to add anything? I'll just say we're talking to our suppliers a lot more before going to market to try and get a sense of is there a market? Uh, and that's really starting to influence our approach to, to procurement. And like Rob said, we're actually, for some of our building stuff, we're just purchasing the materials ourselves and ordering in advance, uh, maybe uh, just, to, just to help out. It's, uh, it's, it's a tough time out there, so uh, yeah. I'm, not a pop I'm not popular with our public works team <laughs> or others when I say, well, maybe you just slow down. I've seen winter maintenance contracts in normal times where you just know when you don't go out to the market because it's, it's the wrong time from a, a, a supply or a diesel pricing uh, piece, and you're going to tie in for seven years, so why would you go then? So I think timing's becoming a really critical issue. You really have to be in tune with what's happening in that market and almost have your finger on the pulse of it all the time. Yep. And all the it's different changing. markets that we operate in, right? Yep. As municipalities. And yep. the, I think the difficulty this time is you don't know when it's going to stabilize. Because there's a number of factors out there that are you know, quite unique probably to our generation. So. Yeah. yeah. I might we, be able to add. Sure, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, there's, there was a whole uh, trend that happened, I would say, uh, 2020, you know, after the, the onset of COVID-19, uh, there was a lot of contract lawyers, procurement lawyers were looking at force majeures, uh, pro provisions that are fairly standard in contracts. Yeah. Uh, and it's all about the interruption that COVID brought. 
and what was a foreseeable circumstance in terms of contracting. Now we're in co, well, you know, depending on who you talk to, we're post or we're, we're still in it. Um, but we, we know that there are impacts and we know that it's hitting the supply chain, we know the, all those things. So there still needs to be a lot of active management of your, all the contract precedents that we use. And it, it's very easy in a municipality because we're, we're very driven by the process, especially as it relates to tenders. Uh, but if you're looking at direct negotiations, you're looking at all of these other items, like uh, doing an RFP process as opposed to just a straight up tender process, then you're re-looking at all those documents all the time because you can't just use the same one you've always used. And so that has generated, I, I, I know, from our staff and, and a lot of the other lawyers I'm talking to and procurement people that I'm talking to, they're needing to look at those and say, okay, what else do we need in these contracts? What else do we need to be accounting for to deal with all of these swings? And are we prepared? Because otherwise, you're sitting in a terrible position at the end where you're looking at, okay, is this contract breached? They're not supplying. And no municipality that's operating with a plan wants to be sitting there looking that. You don't want to be engaging in um, litigation if you know if it's avoidable with with your suppliers that you probably or your contractors that you often use mm -hmm. you know that creates a whole other set of problems and another drain on resources that you don't want to be dedicating your resources there you want to be proactively working on projects yeah yeah, yeah. great thanks for that yeah let's get another question from Mike thank you um, yeah uh, you're live uh, Akash Desai Deputy Mayor of uh, Municipality of Great Highlands um, ORAC 588.17 has introduced some much needed timelines uh, around the evolution of asset management plans uh, in Ontario. Uh, historically, municipal asset management plans have been underfunded, uh, and the final update, which I believe is now in 2025, uh, will require municipalities to look 10 years down the road to, uh, to, to uh, provide a financing plan on how they're going to finance their capital needs uh, to provide the proposed levels of service within that asset management plan. Is there cause for optimism that we'll finally have uh, municipalities appropriately funding their asset management plans, not just, in not just in theory, but also in practice? And if not, how do you frame the messaging around asset management plans to make it more palatable for the politicians uh, to raise taxes to that level and for the public to understand that their taxes need to be raised to that level? Yeah, great question. And a tough spot, obviously, for um, for you and, and other elected officials, right? It's a, it's a pinch. You know the regs are there. You've got to abide by them, and, and it's a tough message to deliver at the doorstep, too. So, Rob, it feels like it's right in your wheelhouse. Gary, maybe it's a, a jump on in terms of capital planning and asset management planning, but go ahead, Rob. So I don't want to make, take a swipe at Gary and his uh, financial people here, but in 2009, <laughs> we brought in PSAP, yep. and onto the balance sheets, we brought the assets onto the balance sheets, and all the finance people thought that was going to be wonderful. Quite frankly, nothing really ever happened out of that, except it's on the balance sheet, and that's not a bad thing. No one pays any attention to it at budget time. It really means nothing, quite frankly, in my humble opinion. I have a battle here. So um, <laughs> fast forward, we've got asset management. And most municipalities have been doing asset management for a long time, individually. Road studies, roads need studies, OSIM inspections on the bridges, uh, whim, uh, um, what was it, um, SIMS and WIMS for water main and sewer and whatever, but it was, never was tied together. So this, that, that's back 25 years. I remember all of this. I hate to give a history lesson here. but. So now in the last um, seven, eight, ten years, we've been bringing asset management, we bring it all together. It actually is an, an amazing thing. I think that the hope that I have is that when it's brought together and, and council is forced to look at it in that way, that it helps them make better decisions in the grand scheme of things. So we've got an infrastructure deficit. Can we afford, while well, we've got the infrastructure deficit, to invest in other things as well? What are the things that are important to our community that we have to invest in? And that's where the difference is going to be made. Can we afford this asset? In our um, transportation master plan, which we're doing right now, we're actually doing a section of that where we're looking at some little used roads and actually eventually closing bridges on them. Not closing them right now, but telling people 10 years ahead, when this gets down to a 10 ton bridge, we're gonna close it. It may be a pedestrian and a cycling bridge or whatever, but it's not gonna be for vehicular traffic and not get into the fight at that time that I don't want this closed. No one ever told me it was gonna be closed. How dare you do this to me? So hopefully we'll get into some better future planning. Um, and, but, you know, politics is politics. I, I, I have the optimism that the information will be there. Will it be well used in every municipality? Hopefully in most. 
Gary said that he's got some rebuttals. No, oh, yeah. my, part of my role is not to referee any, any fights that break out on stage, but yeah. Gary, go yeah. ahead. No, just peace up. So uh, it's a public sector accounting board, so tangible capital assets. Uh, actually, so I was in Mississauga at the time. We fought that tooth and nail because we thought there was no value. Actually, I would say there is value, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because they got the dialogue going with, uh, internally. Uh, we discovered assets we didn't know we had. A lot of land comes, mm -hmm. on, comes on the table there. Uh, and if you've ever, if you ever read the CD How uh, complimentary reports to write every year, they talk about, you, you know, there's budget versus your financial statements. So I think this is a step that actually brings them both together. And I, I really believe eventually that change will happen. Maybe not in my career, but uh, that will be there. So Mississauga, back in those times, there actually was a, a, a campaign uh, by Hazel McCallion on Cities Now, and she said they want 5% uh, on the, uh, it was either 5% the GST or 5% property tax. That got there a lot of attention. So what we've actually found on this is, we used to say infrastructure, and the public wouldn't know what it means, but now they do. Uh, uh, no, we used to boil it down, say it's roads, it's transit buses, it's you know, social housing. The infrastructure actually is meaningful now in, in, in Peel. Uh, and what's been in place in Mississauga is a 2% infrastructure levy since the early 2000s. And in Peel, we've got a 1% infrastructure levy on the tax base and a 5% infrastructure levy on the utility base, all centered around our storytelling about asset management. So we don't set the rules, but uh, actually, and there's a cost to inventorying your, your assets. But it does give you an opportunity to elevate your story. And Peel, I can tell you, we've got a $2 billion infrastructure deficit over the next 20 years. That's in every budget presentation we do. And that has allowed some room, some tolerance for the taxpayer to say, OK, we need that. So, um, but it's expensive to do. Mississauga last year had 17 staff lined up over the next three years to come in to do the work necessary. So, it is a journey, and if you're a smaller municipality, it's, it's a difficult one. So I would encourage you to reach out to all the associations, and we can give you lots of help. There's lots of training going on yeah. as well. Yeah, there is, certainly. Yeah, Rob, you want to add something else? I was at an asset management um, <coughs> seminar yesterday, and um, I got up and asked a question, and I made a bit of a comment, too. And it was that in every municipality, and it doesn't matter if you're big or small in this, if it doesn't get into the staff's sort of every day, every week, every month sort of thing that you do and, and realize this is a part of the game and it gets into the, the council reports, as Gary said, and whatever, yeah. and people thinking about it, it'll never be successful. So I know municipalities have got asset management plans done. Yeah. They've met, they're going to meet the July 1st date. They had a consultant do them. There's some parts of them, you know, you, you, you question how well it's done or whatever, but if, if in those municipalities, if they aren't bringing it in as, a, as an everyday thing, it'll never be successful. Yeah, and I think that's a really great point. Kind of some of the questions that got there about sort of navigating it with the with on the sort of the quote unquote on the doorstep right so encouraging staff to have that into into presentations into reports it, i think it helps with with uh, with the elected officials in terms of being the the torchbearers of that back to the back to the constituents so yeah great comments um, i think this one might be for terry and it's a good question, a bit of a storytelling here, but it says, I don't have concrete data, but anecdotally we're seeing a bit, a bit of a move from larger urban centers near us, to small, near us to our smaller rural community. I know there will be challenges and opportunities with this, but what are the panel's thoughts on how to manage support, and in a way also, it's, it's interesting here, they put in sort of tap into these changes. What should we be considering as local politicians, local staff, local council? So, Terry, maybe we'll start with you from the planning and building side of things, but anyone can jump in after Terry's had a kick at it. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I've been on meetings across the entire province, and it's happening everywhere. Um, every single small municipality I chat to, the migration from the larger centers is happening. Uh, unfortunately, what that is doing is causing uh, both a housing demand as well as a, a housing cost increase. Um, my municipality, for instance, housing has gone up uh, more than double in uh, less than five years. Um, so unfortunately, the people working in my area or employed in my area can't afford the housing anymore. Um, so there's a whole pile of things that um, different municipalities are looking at and exploring. Um, bunch are seeing um, like massive revisions to subdivisions um, to increase the density and introduce a mixed development type, so not just singles going to multi-res. Um, 
there are more high density residential components or properties being developed in the, the smaller areas. Um, as well as a lot of municipalities have introduced um, or have permitted the accessory apartment provisions that the Planning Act introduced a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to get, I absolutely detest the term tiny home, but it's to get the small square footage homes um, as part of your housing stock. Um, so a lot of them aren't like your HGTV sort of square footages, but around you know a comfortable one bedroom apartment size sort of thing. Um, the other thing that I was kind of a little bit surprised at um, in terms of high density development design, um, typically you see developers wanting to put in or, or maximize the density of the units on a property, um, which would be good to keep the price points down uh, from a local perspective, um, but unfortunately they're serving the market that's buying them. So they're putting in um, you know, larger apartments or la larger apartment condos um, because of, again, to support the migration out of the larger centers because, you know, people want to live in rural Ontario and they're working from home as well. So they want, they, they don't want the downtown Toronto, you know, 400 square foot condo feel anymore. They want, they want more space. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's kind of what we're, we're seeing and, and I'm hearing. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of faith, um, that the, proposed planning uh, act amendments uh, with respect to zoning bylaw amendments and site plan approvals are going to speed up any of the pl uh, background planning processes. Um, I'm anticipating there's going to be more pre-submissions and more pre-cons um, than any of us have seen before. Um, I think that was... Yeah, that's I think a that good, was all I wanted That's to a good add. summary for sure. I think you're gonna see those things coming in and a lot of them being turned back to make sure that they're absolutely buttoned up and watertight and pre-consultations, that kind of thing is probably going to be something that, that uh, is employed in a lot of different places. Does anybody else want to add on? Yeah, Rob, go ahead. Just quickly, I think that we're seeing the um, resident expectations change. Um, you know, I'm from a fairly rural municipality, um, been doing things as they have for a long time, but as people are moving from the GTHA, they think that what their services they had before, what they, right. they want here, and, and there's, sometimes there's a difference, and that's, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and those services are not just uh, solid waste, for example. You know, really important things. The obvious one is broadband. Rural broadband is a big one, right? You want to move out to do, be able to do that and work from home, and that can be a, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to mention the other one is drainage. What do you mean I have to pay for drainage? That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've heard it from so many municipalities. It's not the farmers that have to pay the $10,000 assessment. It's the rural residential property with a, with a $200 assessment that uh, causes the grief before council. Yeah, and I'm going to come to the next mic over here, but that raises a really good point. Rob and I talked about it, and I think Kristen and I were speaking yesterday. Uh, we had a sort of a bit of a pre-brief, and, um, you know, there's, I said, I hope you don't mind me putting your sp on the spot here, but there's not a lot of Sid Vanderveeds out there to be able to support that. And so as, as this, as this, this um, migration happens, if we see it continuing from large urban to smaller rural, and those drainage questions come into play, that's an expertise that not a lot of, all, not a lot of municipalities might have in-house. Mm -hmm. So there's a need to leverage that exter external resources, external support, whomever, uh, to be able to support that stuff. So it, it's, again, I, I feel like we might be a bit too doom and gloom uh, on the panel here, but it's another <laughs> thing to think about for, for municipalities as we sort of navigate this change that we've seen over the past two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, just to add, I think the, the, the question is, is it sustainable? Is that going to be the future in 10 years' time? Uh, and I don't think anybody knows that. So what decisions you make in the short term will be interesting around that. But if you look closely at the census, one of the large municipalities in Peel actually shrank uh, in the last census results. So that's an interesting, that's I don't know if that's permanent or, or just temporary. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what happens. But as of right now, that's a pretty interesting data point to see. Yeah. Let's go to the mic here. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Clothier, and I'm the CAO Treasurer for the Township of Perth South. And my question is for Sid this mm. morning. As a rural agricultural municipality, we have a significant amount of municipal drainage. These drainage costs have long been shared on a cost-benefit basis with all the land landowners in the watershed area. 
Recently, the CN Railway has decided they're no longer responsible for these costs, which have shifted their share of the cost to landowners and municipalities, or certainly has the potential to do that. Given the widespread railway infrastructure throughout Ontario's agricultural lands, this is an issue impacting many municipalities. Do you have any advice for municipalities who have drainage projects that cannot be started or completed due to the railway's recent decision? Excellent question, and it's one that was, uh, that was raised before, and it's, it's an issue that's not going away quickly. So first of all, what is the issue? Um, municipal drains uh, in, in rural agricultural parts of Ontario are user pay systems. It's cost shared amongst the property owners in the watershed, amongst the lands and roads. And it also includes utilities, which are defined to include railways as well. Um, railways have a history of over a hundred years of paying their assessments um, up until about two or three years ago where uh, some of the major railway companies decided that we're a federal charter, uh, we're not bound by your provincial laws, and we're no longer paying. Um, it's become a really big, big issue and one that um, uh, Kudos to OGRA, they've taken a leadership role on, as well as a number of other organizations. I don't have a magic answer for you, Rebecca, but I can tell you that I just recently saw a letter from the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, indicating that they've reached out to the Minister of Transportation, the Federal Minister of Transportation. They've also reached out to the president of CN or CP, forgive me, I, I, I think it's CN, um, but haven't got a response yet. So the fact that the minister is on this gives me some hope. But the caution for you is there's a little section, there's a section in the Drainage Act that says land exempt from taxation is still taxable um, um, or assessable under the Drainage Act. But if, um, and then they list a few things like um, regional municipalities or county municipalities, churches, schools, they still have to pay their assessment. And then any others, it says that the municipality has to pay the costs. So the issue is large. Um, if CN or CP or some other railway company doesn't pay their assessment, um, it would fall back onto the municipality. And that's not fair. That's not a communal project. So um, my advice is go cautiously into any new project inform the, the ratepayers who want this and make sure that they're contacting their local MPs as much as their MPPs. Make it a political issue because that's what the railway companies have. Sorry, not a great answer, but I really appreciate you raising it. Thank you. Great question, thanks for that. We've got another question over at the far end here. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Frank Kennis and I'm a counselor in uh, Strathroy Caradoc and I want to go back to the the uh, question just previous about migration. Uh, we've been a, a, a victim or a benefiter of migration over the last uh, number of years. I'm just curious how it's affecting uh, the municipalities where the migration is coming from. Uh, like, do, do you, like, I, I don't see wide swaths of for sale signs here in Toronto or for rent signs here in Toronto. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, and I, I think so much of the migration has been induced by COVID over the last couple of years. Uh, with the pandemic hopefully coming to an end, do you see do you see this continuing, or do you see like a reverse migration going back the other way uh, uh, in in the coming years? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll just open it up. Anybody can jump in. Go ahead. Uh, it's hard. We have no crystal ball. I mean, that's the problem. I've heard also from a talent point of view, it's a challenge for some rural and smaller municipalities where they would offer the quality of life for IT staff, for example and maybe pay them a little bit less, but now the IT staff can actually have the quality of life, stay in the municipality and get the job in the city of Toronto with a higher salary. So it's really, it's, um, it's difficult. And Peel will have one uh, measure of that fairly soon because we're looking at, uh, Council's asked us to do public consultations on the vacant homes tax, uh, which will allow us to uh, introduce a tax on vacant homes. Uh, so that will give us, we don't really know what's vacant out there just now, but based on the census from last year, we, we think there's probably, that will be one indicator for us. But uh, 
no idea. I, I know personal anecdotal stories, but I don't think that's a trend. Mm -hmm. Terry, go ahead. I don't know the same thing. I, I don't know what it's going to mean in five years if, like you mentioned, it was going to be the reversal, everyone jumping back. I think it's really going to hinge on um, working from home. If everyone continues to do that, then it really doesn't matter logistically in the province where you're located. Um, so you choose, yeah, not choose locally to where your job is, but you choose to what sort of, you know, after hour lifestyle that you want. I think that's a really good question. I'm going to jump to, to Rob. I think you had your hand up to answer yeah. as well. But the one to, thing I would add too, just Rob, before, before you get started is, I think that's a really key point. This is, this is weaving into that talent management and, and not just on the municipal staff side, but just in general, writ large, your residents and where they're, where they're finding work. I, part of me thinks that, that, the, that the remote work thing continues for a period of time, if not in perpetuity, because people have gotten used to it now. It feels to me like the job market has switched from an, and maybe this is purely anecdotal, there's not a lot of data behind what I'm about to say, but it feels like it's shifted from a, an employer's market to an employee's market, kind of like in the home world, right? The seller's market versus the buyer's market. It feels like employees are, are sort of being very surgical in where they pick to go. And again, that's not just municipal employees. That's, that's your residents writ large. And, and, you know, an IT professional living in a small uh, community in Ontario uh, where, they, where they get the quality of life that they really like, but they can, they can work remotely and be in, in Toronto uh, and, and reap the benefits of that financially and personally as well. That's, I don't see that ending, but again, that's a, that's a big gaze into a crystal ball that's really difficult, I think, for all of us. Rob, go ahead. Jump in. Two little things. Uh, first of all, I've got a daughter who lives in a neighborhood called the Danforth, just east of here, and um, <laughs> uh, they bought a house in, uh, in the last year, and I can guarantee you there was lots of competition for that house that they bought, so there's not net migration out of there. There's still lots of people living there. The other thing is, the, um, at this conference, we heard the Minister of Transportation, Carol Mulroney, tell us that the GTHA is going to experience growth of a million people per five year, for each five years coming up. So there's not net migration out of there, there's net migration into here. So, Yeah, and maybe to that point, Gary's point about one of those larger municipalities in the GTHA, GTHA in Peel seeing on the stati on Stats Can, the census data showing that there's been a decrease in population. That may be just the blip in the radar if you then combine with what Rob said about you know a million folks every five years. That's that's awfully significant. So, um, we have another question here. Yeah, great. Go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Carla Musso Garcia. I'm the manager of operations for the township of Oromedonte. Um, on the theme that you just spoke about uh, in regards to staffing, so from an operational perspective, we can't work from home. We have to actually you know yep. be there and present. Um, with the trends that we saw with COVID, we had a large migration where houses that four or five years ago were 220,000 have just sold for $1.2 million uh, in our community. Um, so when we're posting for positions for staff that you know, need to live somewhat locally to be able to respond to emergencies, we're just not seeing the amount of, of applications we used to. And we're also seeing that the people who are living in the communities traditionally you know, farming kids who would have been able to move into those types of public works jobs can't afford to live in the communities that they grew up in, mm -hmm. and they need to move out. So we're kind of losing that talent to it. Um, people moving into the community, although the population's growing, aren't coming to work for us for $19, $20 an hour because they've bought a house for $1.2 million. Um, so we're struggling with that, and we're just seeing that massive trend and drop off from a staffing perspective that we're just not seeing the numbers of people applying. Um, so we looked at, you know, where subcontracting things might be a solution. However, our subcontractors are dealing with the same issue that they're not able to get enough staff to be able to finish the projects um, that they've committed to. Uh, even subcontracting out for snow plowing, um, you know, we're seeing four, five, six operators cycle through a route within the season. Yeah. So I'm not sure you're, if you could share your thoughts on that and how we navigate that kind of going forward. In it's a great question. We had some chat about it in the back room, didn't we, Rob? You want to jump in on it? Yeah, I'll start off on this. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday morning with um, a group of people in the same position as me from all over Ontario. We talked about exactly the same thing. And the thing I'll start out with is it isn't just the sector that's dealing with it. It's, you know, the restaurant business, although they've, you know, they've been hammered by COVID over the last couple mm -hmm. of years too, but the ones that have been open, they can't get staff. Truckers, um, you know, we go down the list. There's a whole bunch of industries that are in the same, the same um, um, position. 
I don't know what the answer to it is. Um, yesterday we talked at the, uh, you know, the director of public works sort of people um, that, you know, the reality of paying um, people to do winter maintenance and, and public works jobs, you know, paying them 27, 28, 30 dollars an hour, those days are probably over. It's probably got to go up a lot. Um, you think of paying seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for a single family home, how do you pay for it on a wage like that? You know, the math doesn't add up. So we're going to see some big changes happen in the next two, three, five years, I would think, in how a lot of things work. I don't have an answer for what, what the end game is, but you got to be creative in, in how you can get those those people in the door and then keep them happy when they get there. I think, I th Terry, you can jump in after this. I think the one thing that we talked about in the back room was, uh, before we came on, was, and it's a slow burn win. It's not, it's not a quick solution. It's going to be one of those things that you sort of have to invest time and, and let it grow and let it develop. But, um, you know, internship type programs, internship opportunities where you can attract individuals into the into the sector where they can get really good employment, they can get a lot of skills right up front, and hopefully there's a way to nurture those individuals as the, as the future, uh, future employees of the municipality to help sort of bolster that workforce. But that, again, like everything, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes a plan. It, they, they can't be sort of empty co-op internship placements. They need to have, there needs to be some substance to them and there needs to be the ability to maybe skill up and support those individuals in skilling up bake some of those things maybe into employment agreements so there's some retention clauses in those employment agreements. Those might be things to start to think about to be able to sort of um, plug, the, plug, the, plug the hole, so to speak. Terry, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just uh, I mentioned when I, I started my first question about uh, thinking outside the box. Um, I was working with a municipality and an employer who couldn't fill their, their employment needs. Um, they're trucking in bus loads of people for each shift. Um, and that municipality and that employer were actually looking at um, uh, working together to develop a like a land lease sort of development where there was X number of units guaranteed for the employer, X number of units guaranteed for municipal staff. Then as part of your, uh, you know, uh, uh, job offer to a person is you've got housing, this is what it's costing you. Um, and the way that they were looking at setting it up is that once you no longer need that house, hopefully you've built up some equity that you can purchase one of these higher, hopefully not the $1.2 million house, but you know a, a higher priced house, that the house that, like essentially the contract was built or, or developed in such a way that there was a percentage of equity every year um, with the understanding that the house price would stay low. So even if the market for that 1,200 square foot bungalow was 500,000, when it was built originally, it only cost three, and then the increase in that house cost was a percentage base, not a market base. So again, the second round of, of people could afford that, that house again. So yeah, thinking outside the box, unfortunately, is one of the mm -hmm. solutions we all have to lean to. Yeah, and that's just more resources. I think it's Joanne, I can't see with the light. This gentleman was first. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir, my apologies. Hi, Richard Sparham, I'm a manager of uh, public works for the town of Tilsonburg. I just want to dovetail on the last question, not, not necessarily specific to talent, talent attraction, but talent retention in the context that maybe, and I know Peel has done, does, does their budget somewhere around October of every year or so, but I think the issue within our own and, and to look at the pre presentation this morning on the CEO's survey aspect of the HR pressures as well, you budget, you, let's say you do a one and a half, two, two and a half percent increase to look at the cost of living in our experience of cost of living, something I think is around 5.3 to 5.8 percent. You're looking at it, you know, at one, at one time, $1.80 per liter. So people that are commuting that you have, and so there's those, those internal inflationary pressures on your own staff and trying to keep your own staff kind of able to work under you. And I know the, the general consensus is, oh, you guys are overpaid. Well, we're really not overpaid. <laughs> but you know, it's those, those inflationary pressures, and it's probably a similar answer to that question, but I just wanted to bring that forth as well. Yeah, great points. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. So, uh, the meeting I mentioned before, we talked about this yesterday, and I think that, um, you know, we have to get used to that some of these, some of these salaries have to go up by more than inflation. Um, and um, the other thing is, you need to work with your HR people, and you need to be creative in how you do things. Not everything is about about the dollars, some is it about benefits, 
we do have the big advantage of OMERS. People that drop out OMERS are out OMERS, so they, you know, some people are going to stay because of OMERS, and that, that's a good thing. Um, but work with HR, um, have your counsel, um, you know, knowledgeable that there are pressures there that, you know, money and, you know, addition to benefits, other things, they're all that's going to, all you can do. And mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll go, Kristen, and then maybe we'll go back to the floor. Go ahead, Kristen. I think building on Rob's comment, uh, there's going to be an interesting exercise, as, as many of you will have unionized workforces, uh, to be sitting down with unions and looking at what is the appropriate approach uh, in this new changed environment. So it, there tends to be uh, an approach where it's kind of a one-size-fits-all. So your un often you will see union contracts where you have the office staff treated the same as your operations staff. And that might not work anymore when you have a work from home or remote work contingent in some of your office staff, and yet you have operational staff that need to show up. So compensation, going back to earlier comments, may look like a different thing. And so the question is, is what, what does that mean in your next round of negotiations? And is it, a, is it something you want to be dealing with in negotiations, or are you undertaking reviews? Um, a lot of the, there's been a lot of focus on municipal modernization, on digitization, but also is municipal modernization now revisiting how the workforces are working? What, what makes you, you know, an employer of choice? What makes you, what makes you a desirable employer? Uh, and, and what does that look like maybe in different departments and divisions as opposed to having a one size fits all approach? Because I'm not sure that it, that's going to be a relevant application yeah. anymore. And you don't want to be fighting that out probably at a bargaining table. That's, that, that's going to be a tough go. You mm -hmm. want to have, you know, this is proactive talk. So probably <laughs> the yeah. bargaining table isn't what you, where you want to be having those conversations. It may be where you're, you're fleshing it out. Yeah. Gary, you want to quickly? Well, just remote work is being an employer of choice just now. It's a fact. People will turn away uh, jobs if they don't offer them those solutions. And most of the big urban centres now have a policy in place. Interestingly enough, though, the, uh, the, the province has brought in the right to disconnect, which I think is going to impact the, the workplace mm -hmm. as well. There's no doubt in my mind, 100%, there's going to be upward, upward pressure on municipal uh, salaries, whether it's union or non-union to respond and be able to be flexible enough to attract people from the private sector with a different compensation package. So uh, we'll see how that rolls out. We're in bargaining just now with four different union groups. And then if you throw in fire and you throw in police, they've all got you know, a, a kind of arbitrated settlement and uh, becomes more independent. We'll see what they come up with as well. Yeah, Rob, real quick. Just quickly, I think you need to look at your municipal culture too. And if you've got a, a union management um, um, scenario where they're at each other's throats all the time, and there's grievances all the time, and nobody gets along. It doesn't help things either in re in, in, for retention. So um, try and uh, you know talk things out, have a better, more collegial um, way of dealing with things. I think will help. Yeah, for sure. Is it Joanne? I think. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see the light. Hi, Joanne. Hi. How are you today? Good, uh, thank you, uh, Joanne Vanner Hayden, uh, Councillor Middlesex County Mayor Strathroy Caradoc, and I'm going to dovetail into what you just said about getting along, and it's this is one on code of conduct. I'm going to take you on a whole different straight here. Um, where do our rights as mayors, councillors, politicians that sign the code of conduct end or cross over when we are also citizens of the communities we live in? And I'll give you an example. There's, um, and I'll just make it random, but it actually is a real example. We have two neighbours. They don't really get along. The one neighbour cuts trees to trim for their property and their wheels of their tractor were on the other person's property. So, I don't like you, I'm taking you to court, you trespassed on my property. Okay, the judge says, well, I understand why you did it, but you were with your wheels on that property, so we're gonna charge you, the neighbor that is the nasty one, wins. Now he's got some money, now he goes to the town and he says, that person is a counselor. He signed a code of conduct. He should know better than to trespass on my property. I am now taking you to code of conduct. And I'm thinking, it's a neighbor issue. How the heck did that end up on my council docket? Yeah, great question. <laughs> Kristen, maybe we can sort of tackle this a bit. I think that's one where it's blurring over lines of, of uh, I mean, I want to say that there's two cleared buckets there. One is a personal civil issue between two neighbors. 
one, the fact that one of those neighbors was an elected individual and is bound by a code of conduct. Those are two very separate things. Easy for me to say here, very easy for me to say here, so I do acknowledge that. But I mean, the reality is I hope that there is the ability to have a conversation with the integrity commissioner in that municipality to be able to say, you know, this, this, this is where it started and hopefully there's some, some sober second thought through, through that process with, with an integrity commissioner to be able to offer commentary back to say that these are two very distinct things. One is a civil matter. If the courts decided in that, and Chris Nolino, if they decided in that and it was trespassing, then, then that's, that, that should be the end of that decision pending appeal if possible and that kind of thing. But um, how it bridges over into code of conduct Very is... Very slippery slope. Yeah, it, and I think you're right, Joanne. I think once, once you sort of step on that slope, you can, it gets real greasy fast and you can slide right down. So Kristen, do you want to add anything to that? I, I certainly would echo your comments, Stephen, and it's, it's a huge challenge because there has to be some level of acknowledgement that municipal council members do live in the community. That, that is very much, and that's what makes them great municipal council members because they know they're part of the community. Um, the questions that come up, it, it, it's really about what's in your code of conduct. So, so winding it back to first principles, what allowances are there in code of conduct? Uh, you know, there are going to be personal type situations that arise, and and how much of that is framed in the code of conduct, and and what do you need to do? I would maintain that one of the greatest, it, it's difficult in application, and it's posing lots of challenges and revisions right now about codes of conduct, but the fact now that municipal council members can talk to an integrity commissioner is a wonderful thing in terms of advice because otherwise it was very difficult for a municipal council member outside of you know maybe an office budget that allowed them to go get independent legal advice to access that information. But those are also uh, situations that maybe need to be addressed in the codes of conduct on the front end. To, and it's never gonna be as specific as that. But to appreciate the fact that they're individuals sitting at that council table and what are the rules around that? What does that look like and what does that mean? But that is, those are, are the, hopefully the messy exceptions to the rule, those ones. Yeah, interesting. So make sure we don't have another question. Okay, great, uh, we'll go back to the list of questions we have. Um, We've talked about but one of these, one is, and I'll, maybe we'll skip over this, but I'll read it out. Municipal politicians and staff have been through a lot of change through the pandemic. What challenges do you foresee going forward? Staff recruitment, retention, customer service, consultation, public engagement was sort of some of the questions there. Um, I think we answered a lot of the staff retention and, and recruitment side of things in sort of the last round of questions, but is there anything we want to talk about on customer service um, and or public engagement consultation? Everything seemed to switch to virtual, right? When the pandemic landed, it was whole hog over to, to virtual everything. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on best practices, engagement, uh, customer service, that type of thing? Maybe we'll start with Rob and we can add in. So I talked to somebody from the Ministry of Environment, um, Conservation and Parks um, early on the pandemic, and our discussion quickly came around to, and this is a person that's in the EA branch, is that through this, let's hope that we come out of this a lot better on public consultation than we were before. And I think that the whole switch to virtual actually does open us up to potentially getting to a lot more people. Now, what we have to realize as we do that is not everybody is virtual. So you have to look across your spectrum of um, <coughs> residents and people you want to communicate with and find out the best ways to communicate to the most people that you can. When we used to have in-person public meetings as the main way of communicating with people, Quite frankly, it's a lousy way of communicating with people. Even if you get 300 people out to the end, it's still a small segment of your population. And of the 300 people that show up, there's 20 of them that are outright angry and they dominate the whole meeting. Yeah. Well, that isn't necessarily the gauge to what's going on with this project. So we do need to broaden it out. We do need to do a better job. We've got a, a public consultation, which will be quite controversial coming up. We're gonna do the first part of it entirely virtual. And then we're going to have a fallback where people actually sign up and, and into a slot to come and do one-on-one um, -on -one consultation. Now, it'll be a group probably of about eight or ten at a time, and we're going to have four or five stations in a big hall so we aren't, you know, getting too many people together. But, you know, we, we listened to our counselors as to what they wanted. They wanted to make sure that we had in-person consultation on us. We're looking at the way to get a broader public consultation. 
And uh, I, I hope at the end of this, it's going to be a, 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 an ugly and dirty job at the, the end of the day, but it's an important project for us to accomplish. So. The one thing I'll add in, and anyone else can jump in, is when I think about virtual and in-person and that sort of move to hybrid, what we've learned a lot, and speaking from my role as clerk with, with respect to public meetings, council meetings, uh, committee meetings, et cetera, is that uh, it's a lot more work. And people would say, well, it's easy. You plug it, flip a switch, set up the Zoom, set up the WebEx, whatever, and, and that type of thing. But really what we're finding is you're, you're stitching what used to be an in-person meeting, which could be resourced relatively easily, with a virtual meeting online, and in the back end, we're stitching those two things together and then pushing that out. And so that's the example of council meetings. There's a lot more work that goes into that to make sure that we're meeting all those obligations we have statutorily under the Act and openness, et cetera. And that, that ports over to public engagement and community consultation on any number of major projects that happen in the community. You really have to, it, again, it's, I, <laughs> I hate to say, talking about resources, it seems to be a big theme of the, of the panel today is, is it just takes that extra amount of time and energy to get those things right and make sure that you're not, to Rob's point, you're not listening to the, the vocal minority, you're opening it up to the community to get really good feedback and input. But to do that right and to do it well isn't something that you can pull together you know, an hour before the session starts kind of thing. So it does take some time, it does take some calculation to get that right. I think all that's invisible, isn't it, to the public and probably often to elected officials. So if you talk to your clerk, you'll know that in the back end they're actually spending more money. So it's, a, it's an expensive uh, uh, option. And, it's, and all these things are time, right, Gary? We, yeah. It's more expensive, it's, it's more people, it's more staff. I mean, we would hire staff that, that we could train up relatively quickly on, on sort of the nuts and bolts of the municipal governance world. Now we want also folks that are tech savvy and creative and innovative in how they they pull technology off the shelf and deploy it. And I'll give you an example. We had two folks that would, that would uh, support an in-person council meeting pre-pandemic. We now have five people that are doing it because of that back end. We're pulling in delegates. Are they connecting over the phone? Are they connecting via video? Are they walking in in person? Have they tested a PowerPoint presentation that they're going to deliver to council as a delegate? I mean, the list just goes on and on and on in terms of the resourcing that's required. So. And then not, to, uh, oh, not to continue to do Stephen's uh, budget presentation for his next uh, cycle, but, <laughs> uh, but it's different then locally because then you've got council, you've got committees of council, but then you've got the council law who wants to do a virtual thing and then so do, do staff provide that level of service or do you not? So that's, a, that's another conversation but there's no doubt you've got more options now and talking to our planning team, they like virtual because you get the numbers, you get the people. More difficult if it's a design charrette or something like that. So you've just got another option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's, uh, there are implications too in terms of your notice policies and all of those things. So your uh, municipalities are obliged to have these. Yep. And so yes. now we need to relook at them because now we need to consider what's appropriate notice uh, in this context. Uh, over and over, Planning Act, the Planning Act notice and, and a lot of municipalities that don't, don't have strong regional newspapers have been facing this issue of we're giving notice as required under the Planning Act so that people can participate in a public meeting. And it's you know a requirement for let, let's say put out the sign you know give your notice by letter letter mail, in a certain radius, post it in a regional newspaper. Well, that worked when everybody subscribed, but nobody's subscribing, so it costs you more to advertise. You're reaching less people, and so now there's some legislative reform required. And what does that look like? What are the accept you know what are going to be the accepted means? It used to be regional print. Is it Twitter? I don't, I don't know that it is. Uh, but what is it? Is it posting on a website? And we see we have lots of lots of legislation that says you must give notice by doing yeah. X, Y, and Z. Well, the legislation isn't there to keep. It's not keeping up. And those are those are distinct challenges. And when it matters is um, in the lawfulness of bylaws. When you're passing bylaws and whatnot, it's it's really important to ensure that it, it's there's been some public notice given. And how do you do that? So it means procedure bylaws, we're notice seeing, policies, all of those things. We're seeing legislation that needs to catch up. There's still oh, legislation yeah. that says, and sent by postage, like, like snail mail postage. There's still, there's still legislation that requires it to be posted in a local print yep. media. There's still requirements uh, in legislation that requires you know, original 
pen on paper signatures, right? So we're, we're, we're needing a bit, a bit of update in that regard. Um, let's do a couple more questions. I'm just mindful of time. We're getting near the end. I think there's going to be some sort of catch-all question here, and I've saved one of them for that at the end. But this is going back to sort of the whole uh, uh, municipal operations question. It's about sort of case law and significant cases that have been impacting municipalities in, in regards to municipal operations. And it says, are there any significant cases impacting municipalities relating to municipal operations? So. Kristen, I feel like that's right square in your wheelhouse. You've studied the case law leading into today, and you can offer uh, some wisdom. Rob might have some, some tag-ins, too, here <laughs> from an operational perspective. Uh, there are a few cases that, have, that are kind of they've been, you know, hovering around the Supreme Court. One was decided last year, uh, and one actually will be, uh, I think, submissions are going next this month. So uh, one being, and this is one that shows up at the Supreme Court on occasion, and it's this question of if you're making a core policy decision at, at the council level about, let's say, snow removal. This was the case that went last year. This is the, the Nelson and, and Markey file. Um, there was a, a lot of discussion at the Supreme Court about this issue of is this a core policy decision because a municipality is immune from liability if it's a core policy decision. The devil, of course, is always in the details. Uh, did you operationalize that decision? If you operationalized it, you did it wrong, there's gonna be a whole bunch of liability attaching. So this was really a question about a person climbing over a snow bank, sidewalks were cleared, road was cleared, there were snow banks along the sidewalk, person climbing over the sidewalk, or, or over the snow bank onto the sidewalk, and injured their leg. So did, did liability attach to the municipality? So the Supreme Court has revisited this a few different times, and it's, it's honing this idea about what is a core policy decision. Uh, impacts for municipality, and this is one that kind of rocked the legal papers, because depending on how you read this, the thought is, is the courts might be digging in a bit more as to in, in limiting what's a core policy decision. So that has big implications for municipalities in terms of liability, because those are personal injury damages. Uh, the one that's going forward uh, in, in the submissions will be made in the, in the coming weeks is a Ministry of Labor case uh, where, and it's a Greater Sudbury case, where uh, the ministry charged both a construction company and the city uh, as an employer under the Ministry of Labor when an individual uh, was uh, ultimately a fatality in a construction project. So the question was, normally in a, in a municipal context, if there's a constructor that comes in, the municipality tries to transfer over the liability for that construction pro project to the construction company. But most municipalities have, of course, inspectors that are checking in, contract administrators making sure that the contract's being followed. Supreme Court's considering this issue of who was the employer and who does the liability attach to? So there are a number of municipal interveners at this, uh, uh, on this one, and it'll be really interesting to see. I know a number of us are watching out to see what, what this means because it could attract some big liability if, if the decision ends up being consistent with what the Court of Appeal has determined. Uh, the municipality was found to be an, em an employer in that case, meaning that the liability would attach. So big questions around uh, liability transfer and, and will be very important moving forward. So, that, so that, that's a great one because that's one that came to mind for me. The good news is in this sector we collaborate so much and I know there's several uh, you know, city solicitors uh, you know, getting together on that one to, 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 I don't know the legal term, but to let the Supreme Court know that mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got an interest. There's another related one, not quite legal, but uh, the province up to the end of last year, I believe, indemnified us for COVID uh, costs from an employee perspective. That's ended now, I believe, from looking at our lawyer on the panel. So the WSIB are now starting to issue some uh, decisions uh, and holding the, the, the municipality uh, liable. Uh, so I can't get into too many details on that, but that's another new thing. Um, it's almost a wee bit like the presumptive legislation for fire and cancer. So, okay, where does that go and does that scale? Yeah. Hopefully not. Rob, last comment, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um I'm not going to comment on any of these cases, but what I will comment on is that councils, as they're trying to save money sometimes, they're, they're trying to, um, you know, hone in on 
reducing operational costs and whatever, sometimes you get a little close to the line and you know, you look at things like minimum maintenance standards and if your municipality is living to the edge of minimum maintenance standards, you're living in a dangerous territory every day. If you're, if you're trying to say, okay, I met the minimum and that's where I'm at because when you're hovering around the, you know, when you're on the edge of the cliff, sometimes you fall off, Yeah. right? And, uh, and uh, so don't hone it too close. Right, yeah, build some buffer. I think we'll wrap up with that. We've got, uh, we've got some time left, but I'm, I'm mindful of uh, the delegates and, and your time as well.